Okay, for food, for the tidal flat. Plus two. Oh. Plus one, plus two. Plus two. Plus two. That, that group. Now they are cooking. <laughs> 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 okay, so plus two means many, many people benefit from the food from that. Yes. So the and I think because the, the mud skipper is solved quite widely, there's a lot of other food production coming off there in terms of shellfish. We had the shellfish for lunch yesterday. I would probably go pl double. T Two plus. Okay, you've got to find the two plus. But only two fishermen are going there for harvesting the muddy skippers and yeah. things. But so look, if you consider the exchange, yeah. only two fishers are getting the benefits from the community. That's so right. Why we will go to for the double plus? Because it's the number of people who get the food. It's not just the fishermen. It's the number, if the fi so if there is only one boat, but that one boat catches many, many, many fish, lots of people eat those fish. Yeah. So it, it, it isn't so much the, the person that directly benefits. But they're getting only the mud skipper, not... But there are also, there are people collecting shellfish. So at lunchtime we had the cockle. The crabs, we had crab, all that is collected from the mud flat. So there are many different food sources coming from that mud flat, and because there are many sources, there are many, many hundreds, it's probably thousands of people, well it is thousands of people, benefit from that food. Do you get that? <laughs> so it could actually, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the scale, but yeah, so the benefit again is probably not just local, but it is also regional. And I don't think it's probably global, because I don't think much of this is exported. Um, so I would say that's a double plus. Okay, any fuel being collected or harvested? Did anyone get a pl anything but zero for fuel? Zero. Zero. Brilliant. Fibre. Genetic resources. One plus. One plus. We had a zero there, we have a one plus there. You had double plus for genetic resources. Okay, this is in right. I will ask the people who put zero, why did you put zero for genetic resources? Is that because you thought there were no genetic resources being harvested? Right. Because the genetic resources under provisioning services, this is the stuff that people get from nature. And it would be whether there were some unique genetic types, be that plants or animals, that people are harvesting or collecting from that specific site. So an example might be a genetic type of rice, which might be very local, and it might be very important maybe for medicinal purposes as well, but it's a local genotype. It's a local genetic strand of rice, as an example. And so what we would need, we'd need some local genetic type of plant or animal that people are taking from that site. Now, it might be the mud skippers are a local genetic type, but I don't actually know that. I know mud skippers are collected in many countries in the world and eaten. It might be there are other things, but I don't have the knowledge that are people actually collecting something of a local genotype. Um, so my, if I was doing this assessment, that would be a question mark for me because I don't have the local knowledge. But it might be, that it could be one of the animals, or maybe even the algae, because there's no real plants there, is being collected, is locally a local genotype which is important. But I, I don't actually know. So I think, I would probably put a question mark, but it, at the most I might put one plus, at the very most. Does that make sense? 
And this is one of those services that a lot of people struggle with. And some sites you might work on, it might be, I've worked on sites in Europe where they have a, a species of cattle, a cow, which is a local cow that has been bred over many, many generations that you only get in certain wetland types. And it's an animal that's adapted to that environment. And so that's a local genetic resource. Um, but again, in this social context, I don't know whether there are local genotypes. And I always use an example from Sri Lanka in Colombo, where there was some local rice that were grown, which were local genotypes, which are really important because of the medicinal properties they had as well. So it provides two services. It's so I would put a question mark for that. So unless anyone's got some better evidence, I will go with a question mark. If I can find the question mark on the keeper. Right. Okay, natural medicines. Well, I have a question. Yes, certainly. So can we then consult? Yes. And then Absolutely, yeah. So in this situation, what I would recommend is if you've come in from the field and you've done an assessment and that you do have some question marks, that highlights these knowledge gaps where you really then need to maybe go and talk to someone and ask them. But also it highlights the need for local knowledge. So hopefully if you have local knowledge when you're doing the assessment, you get less question marks anyway. But if you still have that local knowledge and there are still some things you're not sure about, it highlights when you come back, maybe I need to just do some search on the internet or go and talk to some stakeholders or talk to the local community or talk to one of my members of staff or a colleague. So yes, it, you can change these from a question mark to a, a better evaluation. But it's a good way to uh, highlight it. And again, rather than jumping to conclusions and putting in something you think might be right, it's sometimes better to put a question mark. Okay, natural medicines or pharmaceuticals? Plus. Single plus there. Anyone else get a single plus? Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Okay. I would say uh, I spoke to some groups, and again, I only have this knowledge because I've been here before, but there are some people that collect the clay, and they use the clay in cosmetics. And it helps people's skin, so it's a sort of, it is a natural medicine, a pharmaceutical. So some people do harvest the clay from the mudflat and use it in cosmetics which have some sort of pharmaceutical or ma medicinal benefit. But included this, uh, you put that under clay harvesting? Clay harvesting. You could put it under both, yeah. So I would say it can go under both, but I would actually, I would put it there as a single plus. Ornamental resources, so these are things, sorry, a question there? Once you put a plus for natural medicines or pharmaceutical, yep. do you double plus and the clay, or do you have to choose either one? What I tend to do is I would put it under both, because what you're saying is people are harvesting the clay, because, well, they're harvesting the clay because the clay has a value in itself. Then the use of the clay could be many different things. So they could be harvesting that clay to make bricks. They could be making, harvesting the clay to make figures or pots for some sort of local sort of um, handicraft. And that's why the comments are really important. That's right. So you can make that cross-reference. That's why I always say try and write down as much information in the comments. Because you could say people are harvesting the clay, but you're picking up the fact that it could be used for medicine under natural medicine, and you're picking up the fact that it might be used to make figures or something else under ornamental resources. And this is why writing the comments is important, because you can make these connections. So moving on to ornamental resources, did anyone get anything under that? Zero? zero. zero. We had a one plus. Zero. We had a zero there. One plus. one plus. Okay, the people that put one plus, why? What ornamental resources do you think people were collecting from? Oh. Ah, shells. Ah, shells. Mm -hmm. Nice one. So people are collecting shells. So as a byproduct of the food, they're also getting the shells. 
Now, some of you might have noticed, actually, um, at the restaurant, they had huge bags of shells outside. And you're right, people might be using those for ornamental purposes. So that was a good one. So that, we'll put that down as a single plus. Clay. Well, I think we've already answered this one. <laughs> and energy. So this is for harvesting energy from flows of water through hydropower or through flows of wind. Zero? Perfect. Okay, now the regulating services. Air quality regulation. This is the ability of wetlands to improve air quality, to take out particulate matter and to improve air quality. What do we have for that? We had a double plus there. Double plus there. At a zero there, right, that's a bit of a difference. Plus, one, plus. one plus there. Double plus. Right. In terms of the air quality regulation, who benefits? I know humans. <laughs> but who benefits from the air quality regulation out on the mud flats? So there's no one living around there. There are a few fishermen out there, very small number of fishermen. But also, how, is the, how are the mud flats improving air quality? Are there any plants or trees that are trapping any particulate matter? So again, this is where you've got to think about the processes of how, how are we going to remove pollutants? Is there a source of pollutants out there? So with, are there cars? Are there a lot of traffic generating uh, a pollutant? Are there s other sources of pollutants from maybe industry or dust from quarries or something? And are there the mechanisms then to trap those particulate matter which could be damaging to people's lungs? So you need a source, if you're going to regulate something, for, and this is the same for many of the regulating services, there needs to be a source of something that is being regulated. And in this one it would be air pollution. And if there isn't the source of pollution, then it's highly unlikely the, the service will be delivered. Equally, if there's no one directly benefiting, you might have really good air reg quality regulation, but if there's no one benefiting from that, then the service isn't being realised to human society. So I'd say in this situation, the tidal flats, there isn't really a source of pollution out there in terms of air pollution. It's the, the air quality is pretty good. There's not a lot of heavy industry around. There's not high numbers of cars driving through there. And there's a very, very low number of people. I mean, we are looking at probably tens of fishermen out there. So I would say that would be a zero rather than a plus. There's also really no mechanism in terms of the structure of the vegetation. It's very much an open, flat landscape. Does that make sense? So that group can stop smiling and thinking they're really smug because they might have got it right. <laughs> we'll come back to you in a minute. <laughs> OK, local climate regulation. So this is the ability of the wetlands to improve the climate on a local level in terms of moderating temperature, maybe generating local rainfall. We have a one plus out there? One plus? Two plus? So we're going one plus, two plus. So basically, I think without a doubt, that mud flat area is absorbing heat from the sun. It's transpiring water, oh, sorry, evaporating water. There is some transpiration. So it will be locally reducing air temperatures, without a doubt. But I don't think there's many people that benefit from that because of the distance of the mud flats. They are several hundred metres away from where people live because there is quite a large coastal strip uh, in terms of the reed marsh. Um, and there's not many people out there. So I would say if you had the mud flat going right up to areas of population, it would probably be two plus because there could be many, many people living in those areas of population. 
But because of, from where we saw the mudflats, there was a big gap between the mudflat, then the reed marsh, and before you get to a lot of people, it's probably only a small number of people benefit from that. So I would probably go for one plus rather than two. But, it, but if it was a slightly different configuration, and other parts of the mudflat, where you have mudflat coming right up to centres of population, you would probably go for two plus, because many more people would benefit. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So we'll go one plus. OK, global climate regulation. One plus? Question, Question mark, OK. Zero. Zero. One plus. One plus. And not sure. Again, I would say if you're not sure, then the question mark is obviously the right answer. But um, there's some very, very good research that shows that tidal mudflats um, are very, very organic rich. There's a lot of organic material that is sequestered, and they can be incredibly important stores of carbon. Um, ideally, I mean, we don't know that just looking at that mudflat. You'd need to walk out there and dig a hole down sort of four or five metres to see how much carbon would be in the soil. But there's a very good evidence um, when we looked at some of this um, the day before yesterday in terms of the IPCC reports that mudflats and coastal wetlands are incredibly important stores of carbon and that they sequester carbon at a very high rate. And if you think about the, the geomorphological processes and the biogeochemical processes, you have areas where a lot of sediment is being deposited coming off the land. A lot of that is high in, in organic material from um, the catchment. That is getting deposited on these mudflats and it's almost permanently waterlogged because of the environment it's in. So the organic material breaks down very, very slowly and the, the conditions in the soil are anaerobic or anoxic and therefore you don't get a breakdown of that carbon, you get accumulation of the carbon in the sediment. And as soon as you start accumulating carbon, that is carbon that isn't in the atmosphere. And because it's not in the atmosphere, then it's a store and it is helping reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, therefore in terms of climate change and changing the carbon balance in the atmosphere. If that area was drained, a lot of that carbon would go back into the atmosphere and that would be a negative, but for this one I would say it's a positive. And I would say because it's a positive and it's, if it's affecting, glo if it's a global climate regulation, they said you need to use this. Ah, okay. Because it's a, cli a global a global climate regulation, then it, many, many people are benefiting. So I put that down as a double plus. Does that make sense? Yep. But again, if you're not sure, what you might want to do is go away and see if someone's done a study on the mudflats in this part of the country or this part of the world to find out whether they were good sources of carbon. OK, water regulation, regulating the flows of water. What do we have for that one? One plus. One plus. One plus. One plus. That's good. And regulating fl uh, flooding. One plus. One plus. Yep. Again, for both of those two, they're positive, but I don't think a lot of people around the area are benefiting from it, so it's only a one plus. If you had large centres of population right up against the tidal floods, you might change that to a double plus because more people would benefit. And again, in terms of storms from the sea, was that people have that as a one plus as well? One yep. And again, I think those three are very similar in terms of the fact that there's, because of the location, the geographical location of this tidal flat, it is providing the service, but not a huge number of people are benefiting. Okay, regulation of pest species such as mosquitoes. Uh, rats, other pest species there might be? Zero. zero. Okay, they're saying zero. Anyone else? We have a one plus, was that? Zero. Zero. Zero, zero and one plus. Okay, so the people who said one plus, you're saying that there was regulation of pests. Why are you saying one plus? But 
Yeah, I would say that the site is very important because it has a very, very high number of, um, of shorebirds and other birds feeding. They might be controlling some of the pest species, but then you have to think, okay, if it's mosquito, think of the mosquito's life cycle and think of the birds that are on the mud flat. Most of the birds on the mud flat don't eat mosquitoes flying in the air, feed on the mud. So, okay, so if they're not going to take mosquitoes that are flying, they're going to eat the larvae, but the larvae don't live in the mud. The larvae live in stagnant water. So even though there's many, many birds that could actually eat those larvae, I don't see a mechanism because it's the wrong type of bird and the wrong type of environment. If that was all stagnant water and you had different types of birds that were eating insects in the water column, then you maybe say that it would be. So I, I, I'm struggling to see the ecological mechanism of how birds would eat the mosquitoes. Now the, what you might have, and again I don't know this because I don't have enough knowledge, is it might be there are many mosquitoes flying around over the mud flat, and maybe at night time you might have many bat species which might be hunting over the mud flats and the bats might be eating the mosquitoes off the mud flats as they're flying but i don't know that i don't we weren't there at night time we weren't monitoring bats we haven't had any discussions about bat species because bats can be a very good control of mosquitoes at nights so i'm struggling to see and also, I don't have any evidence there are pests there in the first place. So, pest regulations can be quite a difficult one, because if there isn't a pest to regulate, then that's a zero. Um, and if, if there is a pest, what is the mechanism that it's going to be regulated? So, I would say in that one, I would probably put a question mark, but I think it would either be a zero or a question mark. But I will let you make the decision. So what do people think? Which one should it be? Or are people who still say, no, it's still one plus and we want to defend our one plus? Because we are also expecting that in a very dynamic ecosystem, where water is, again, if water comes up, and then it dries out, it will come again. And in that so many pests get killed also uh, when it is exposed to the sun. Right. So there is one possibility, that's why even the mosquito eaters can kill because of the challenging water. I mean, but how many pests are there? Is there any pests? Uh, well, this is the qu yeah, I mean, do we know whether the pests are there in the first place? Uh, I think you should ask your colleagues. <laughs> yeah, is it, who then benefits from that? Okay. Priyani, would you like to try and shed some light on this? Now these droppings would be on the mud flat. Yes. And then the tidal waves, you know, come in and go out very much what he's saying. Whether this can be considered as a regulation. In terms of regulating the droppings, the, 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 the micro parasites, parasites that might be in the might, might be in the feces. Birds can be a, a vector. Can be a vector. Yeah. I mean, that might be more, yeah, that could be more under disease rather than pest, because they're vectors of disease rather than necessarily pests per se. But it, yeah, it's exactly what you mean, yeah. And we're going to come on to that in terms of avian influenza. Pest is also a definition. Yeah, that's right. So. Microphone, please. Microphone, please. Sorry. Microphone, please. Insects are present there, but there's It comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. So there's very little stagnant water, I think. I mean, there might be a few pools, but I think you're right. It's quite a dynamic environment. So, and I think unless we walked out over the mud flats and saw whether there were lots of mosquitoes around, lots of other pest species, I think we don't really have the evidence. Uh, but also I think I pick up on the point of the, the group at the back. 
even if there were the mechanisms, who benefits? I mean, maybe those pest species could be coming into the town and they would be travelling. So that is possible. But uh, we need a decision. What are we going to go for? Zero or question mark? Zero. Okay. The zeros have it. Okay. Disease regulation, which in some ways is similar. What do we have for that? Zero. 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 Now, interestingly, I mean, both the human... Was it zero? It was definitely zero for livestock, because there's no livestock out there. But interestingly, when we did this... Uh, it was probably a couple of years ago, we had some colleagues from China. And what they said is it's actually negative. And their argument was that this is a migratory bird site and migratory birds are a vector for avian influenza. And because this is very attractive, for migratory birds, and we know that we have many migratory birds that come here, tens of thousands come here, that actually having those mud flats is a negative because it exposes people to the risk of avian influenza. So H, um, H5M1, avian influenza, which we know wild birds can be a vector of, they're not the only vector, but they can be a vector that it could be that the fact that there's birds coming there could expose people to the risk of avian, avian influenza. Which is a really interesting one. Priyani, would you like to comment on that one? Yes. I mean, being a parasitologist, I yeah. want to take one step further and talk of zoonotic species. Yeah. Because sometimes they have a definite life cycle, but it can also cross the life cycle to another species. So I'm thinking mud skipper can be a... A vector. Yes. Yes. Can be a reservoir even. Mm. So it's just to think about. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying... I have no proof to say that the mud skipper is a zoonotic species. A zoonotic you know, disease is when it has its usual life cycle, but it has the ability under certain circumstances to jump into another, mm. another animal. So just, I just wanted to add to this because we're talking about the negative yeah. um, aspect of the mind flat. Yeah. So, so you could see that the argument that my Chinese colleagues were putting forward was that because birds could carry avian influenza, they could be a negative vector of um, disease. Therefore, because that site is very attractive, it could be negative. I think the question then comes is what evidence is there that any human has ever contracted avian influenza from wild birds that have gone on the tidal mudflat? And I think the answer to that is probably zero, maybe less than zero, if that's possible. So I, I think I can see their argument, but I don't see, again, if there isn't a disbeneficiary, if there isn't a victim, then it can't be a negative. Someone's got to be losing out for that service to be a negative. So even if we had birds that carried avian influenza that came to the mudflat, if humans aren't then contracting avian influenza, the service isn't being realised, then it has to be a zero. Um, unless we think that the actual mudflats are reducing the incidence of diseases. Yeah. And, and Rob, just so I, do you think uh, information that they get about the uh, when? Uh, the baby, they close, they close it. If there are like warnings from the ministry uh, that there's a potential risk for even influenza, uh, would the information about that help in you know? Um, yes. Decision this because certain big they can close for a certain period. That's right, they do. Yeah. They do so. Yeah. So, uh, as Norman says, and it's not just in Sunshine Bay, in several wetland sites, and I know in Europe when there have been risks of outbreaks of something like avian influenza, and it's not just avian influenza, but that's one which is a high-profile uh, zoonotic disease, some wetland sites, they close and they don't allow the public in because there is a risk. Or they might say that the public are only allowed in certain areas where there's less birds. So you're right. If that is the case, then you think, well, maybe there is a risk there. But again, 
even if there is a risk and the government or the local site manager might have closed the site, if no one has actually contracted avian influenza, then again, that service isn't a negative because it hasn't actually happened. Um, so, but it, again, that's a good way to, to think about it. If, and if, if anyone has the, the real misfortune of managing a wetland where people have contracted avian influenza because of wild birds, and the chances of that, talking to my colleagues who know more about this than I do, are very, very slim anyway, um, then that would be a negative. But it would be quite a unique situation for that to actually happen. So I would go in this situation, I would go for a zero in this situation. Okay, erosion regulation. What do we have for that one? So this is where the, the wetland has the ability to reduce energy and to allow, to, pre to prevent erosion of sediments, of riverbanks, of coastal cliffs, whatever it might be. One plus, yeah. And I think the mudflats, because, again, this is where and one of the skills you need to actually do these assessments is you need to be a geomorphologist, you need to be an ecologist, you need to be a social scientist, you need lots of skills. From a geomorphological point of view, mudflats are low energy environments where you deposit sediment, it isn't eroding. I mean, there are some local channels that are eroding, but overall, I think it's a plus. And in terms of who benefits from that, it means that the people that are fishing out there, harvesting out there, the tourists, there's a small number of people that benefit, so that would be a, a single plus. Water purification, the ability to improve the quality of water, what do we think of that? Single plus or is that two plus? plus. One plus? One plus? Yeah, again, it's a, deep, it's a depositional environment, a lot of the sediment that's in the water column I don't know when we were on the boat whether people noticed as the boat was moving, the water was, the propellers were generating lots and lots of sediment. That water is very heavy in sediment. And the tidal mudflats are an area where that sediment gets deposited, which will benefit the people who are fishing out there. It will clean the water, improve the water quality. So, yeah, that's definitely a single plus. Pollination. Zero. Yeah, the, there's not really the habitat for pollinators, for bees, for, for pollinating birds, for butterflies, for other insects. The, the habitat isn't there, so the ecological link isn't there, so I think that's a zero. Salinity regulation, the ability to protect freshwater areas from saline areas. What do we get for that? Anyone get... One, for salinity regulation, one plus? One, yeah. And again, because it's a tidal environment and it's protecting the freshwater areas in land, that'd be a single plus. Fire regulation, so protecting people from fire, so get, forming a barrier. Zero. Zero? Zero? I mean, I think... I, so there's got to be a mechanism, again, for the regulating services, the key thing is to make this link between what is the mechanism, what is it regulating. So for fire to start out in the water, it's quite difficult. When I was at school and we studied physics, you can't really set fire to water, it's very difficult. And so there's no one living out in the water, so the people that it would be, would be protecting are living on the land. So there'd need to be a mechanism for fire to get from one side of the tidal flat to the other. And I can't see how fire could start, unless a, uh, a fishing boat went up in fire, but then how is that going to stop? I could then see how the fire would not be able to go across the tidal flat. But I can't really see a mechanism for fire. And the usual ones are lightning or um, human activity. And there's, I can't see that mechanism. So without the mechanism to regulate, I would put it as a zero. So again, it's making that link between what is it that it's regulating. It might have the potential to regulate fire, but I don't see how it's got a mechanism where fire would start. And noise and visual buffering. 
So can this reduce the level of noise or the impact of sort of sight lines of activity? Zero. Zero? I, I would say zero again for the reasons that, first of all, it's a very, very open landscape and noise travels very quickly across the mudflats and you can see for a long, long distance. So it's not actually visually buffering anything. But equally, there's nothing really to buffer. There's nothing that people are looking at which would be offensive or intrusive. So I would say zero. How are we doing? Right. OK, and cultural heritage. So was it important from a cultural heritage point of view? We have a single plus there, group over there. What have you got? Single plus. Single plus. Why? Using the mud, mud field, mud yeah. So I think you're right. There, there's some. There's a traditional fishing technique being practiced out there, which is part of the cultural heritage. They're using the hook for fishing. That's right. It's yeah, it is a unique. It's a local culture. It's part of the cultural identity of this area. The the, the um, mud skipper are part of the local cultural identity. So I think that's a single plus. Recreation and tourism. Double plus. Double plus. So I think there's many, many people. I mean, we, we saw the queues for the boats. And this was a quiet day in the middle of the week. If you came in there was summer, those queues go all the way back. So there's many, many people going out there looking at the mud flats. We are not listening to the voice of many groups. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the aesthetic value of the area. One plus. So I, I, could, I would argue that could also be two plus because people go out there because it's a, it's a very different landscape to look at and it's, in its own way it's quite a beautiful landscape. And the reason people go out there for tourism is because it's not just a, a, a path to somewhere, it's because it's a nice landscape to look at and it's aesthetically pleasing. So I would say probably two plus, because many, many people benefit. Spiritual and religious values. What have we got? We got a question mark or a zero? Now, I don't know whether there's anyone, whether Xiongbo or, or Mr. Sir's not in here, I have somewhere in the back of my head that there is some spiritual connection on a local level with the mudflat, but I, I'm not sure. And quite often, unless you've got the local knowledge of sort of religious or spiritual cultures, it's really difficult to answer this one. So in some places in the world, I know that um, there are sort of myths about sort of spirits that live in marshes and live in these sort of areas that live in tidal flats, there are um, religious festivals which involve going out into this sort of environment. But for this location, I don't actually know. Um, I would need to ask people to find that information. Xiongbo says none. Pardon? Xiongbo says there's none. Okay, so there's, from a local context, Xiongbo, who's our local expert, uh, is saying that there's no sort of spiritual or religious value with the, swat, with the uh, mud flats. So we would, using Xiongbo's knowledge, we would put that as a zero. <laughs> and so in your notes, you would say, blame Xiong, Xiongbo if this is wrong. OK. <laughs> OK, inspirational value. This is the ability of a wetland to inspire people, to motivate them, to make them feel good about themselves, feel good about telling other people about it. So, double plus. Double plus. One, plus. <laughs> one plus. One plus. So again, the, when you're thinking the difference between one or two plus, it's really the, the number of people that is probably the simple way to think of that. And I think... If we're saying many people go out there for tourism, many people think this is aesthetically pleasing, you could probably follow the same argument that many people think this is also inspirational. And unless you did some analysis of those, what percentage of people thought it was attractive and were then also inspired, 
I would probably go for two plus, but one or two plus definitely. Does the the scope have an influence also? Because you're trying to measure how many yeah. amount of get get an idea of how many people uh, get inspired. Yeah. And so probably can you link that to the local, regional, global? And if you check global, then it's. That's probably can give you uh, not always because you could have let's say um, a wetland which is globally inspiring um, but only inspires five people yeah so it could, so those five people might live in five different countries and they're inspired by that wetland but that's still only a small number of people because it might be they're the only five people who ever visited that wetland. Um, so it doesn't always follow if it's global that it's a double plus. Usually it would, you're right, the logic would be usually, but there can be situations where that might not be the case. I would say here that because many, many people, we know there are hundreds of thousands of people visit this site, and probably a high number of those go out and look at the mud flats. And they probably are quite inspired by it. But what percentage of those people that are inspired and what percentage of people just go out and go, oh, look, there's a mud flat, that's nice, and then go home? We don't know. Social relations. This is the ability of wetlands to sort of build social cohesion, to put communities together of groups of people. One plus. So I would say there's a community of traditional fishermen and there's probably a, another community of shell fishermen. So, but there are only, there is only small communities. I wouldn't say in this situation that the people, the tourists that visit, are, have a social relation. They just come and they go. However, if, in some wetlands, what you do have is sometimes you get a group that form like the friends of a wetland. So you might have people that say, well, I visited this wetland, and this now, because I've been inspired by it, I think it's beautiful, I will now sort of subscribe to a newsletter, or I will maybe send money every year. And that does build a sort of a social network of people that support a wetland, or they might look at it on the Facebook page regularly because they are interested in that wetland. Um, but usually it's about the local groups that are actually based on the ground. And that's where, you, again, whether it be local or a regional or a global benefit, here, I think it's probably a single plus because it's really probably the local people, the groups of traditional fishermen and shell fishermen. And education and research. One plus. Well, I would say if you use the sort of Ramsar definition of sort of SEPA, communication, education, participation, uh, public awareness, etc., cetera, um, that actually in terms of awareness raising as a form of education, there are many, many people that go out and look at the mud flats. If you go around the visitor centre, you learn about the mud skippers, the traditional fishing. Um, and I think it's probably a double plus because it's, it is part of an education centre and a visitor centre. If that education visitor centre wasn't there and only a small number of people visited, I would say it would be a single plus. But because, again, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of people that visit, they read about the mud flats in the visitor centre, they look at the displays, they look at videos, they go out on boats. I would say the education from a broader education, not just thinking about academics in terms of schools or universities, colleges, but thinking about broader sort of SEPA as an education, I would say that's two plus. Is everyone happy with that as a, an approximation of what we thought for the tidal flats? Okay. So, I think we didn't have, we weren't too far out. There were a couple where we weren't too sure. Um, um, but it does show the need to sort of maybe think some of these things through and to make these connections. We'll try, we've got about... Uh, half an hour before the tea break, um, or a quarter of an hour or so before the tea break, we'll try and go through the next ones a little bit more quickly. Um, what I'm going to do is, how do I save that? That's it. I'm going to save it before I lose it all. Okay, so we will try and go through these now. Oh, sorry, we have a question. We've got a microphone. Sorry. 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 Sorry
This guy. Oh. Oh. Yeah, because we zoomed. <laughs> sorry, we missed that. Then. Which one? Supporting below. Ah, right. Okay, sorry, we missed that support, and that's why I didn't want to zoom. Sorry, right. Thank you very much. I forgot about the supporting services. After saying they're the most important, and then I forget them. So, so soil formation. Did anyone not get double plus? Again, be because if we think about the iceberg, that the supporting services support all the other services, and the fact we have many, many other services, that the whole thing about the tidal mudflats, they are an area of deposition of sediment. They are forming soil the whole time. Um, and so therefore, the, and because of all the other people that benefit from all these other services, if you didn't have that soil forming mechanism, that sedimentation mechanism, you wouldn't get those other services. It has to be a double plus. Primary production. We have a zero there. So again, this is the, the ability of wetlands to convert sunlight into growth. Um, there's algae forming there. Um, there are algal mats. We didn't really see them at this time of year and from our location. Um, but also that, that primary production, even though it wasn't obvious in terms of lots of green vegetation or lots of algae, it drives the whole system. Um, so in terms of the fisheries, in terms of the, the value for shorebirds, um, is actually quite, it, it's important. So I think in this situation, because so many other services depend on it, um, I would say even if there wasn't a lot of obvious sign of primary production, again, understanding how a tidal mudflat works in terms of how it can convert it, um, sunlight into, into sort of plant growth or algal growth. I would say that's important because it drives a lot of these other services. You wouldn't get the network of fishermen if you didn't have the primary production because there would be nothing in the food chain for the mud skippers to feed on. Um, so I would put that down as a double plus. And, and actually, for all these supporting services for the tide mud flat, I'd put them down as double plus because you're making the link back that that supporting service is supporting these other ones. So in terms of nutrient cycling, we've already said it's purifying water, it's depositing sediment, and we're already saying that from a water purification, that's a single plus. Um, you could argue that maybe the nutrient cycling, are not, because not many people are benefiting from the water purification or the sedimentation, but part of that nutrient cycling will also be cycling through the animals in terms of the migratory birds. They'll be part of that nutrient cycle. The fish will be part of the nutrient cycle. So when you start thinking about how nutrients are cycled through the system, you end up thinking, well, actually, it links into lots of the other services. And if those other services have many people that benefit, then that nutrient cycling is really important to support those other services. Does that make sense? And this is why I made the observation two days ago, and I'm, I'm going to put the same for these two, and definitely in terms of provision of habitat, because we know that there's globally important species that come here um, and that people then come and view those species and that we, we have, as a society have said those are important species. And this is where if you don't understand the role of these supporting services and quite often a lot of ecosystem service assessments don't look at supporting services because in some ways this is where they, they slightly differ, is the supporting services don't always directly benefit humans, but they maintain the conditions and they support the conditions which allow the other services to give benefits to humans. And if you don't think about the processes, the ecological processes, the biogeochemical processes, the hydrological processes that drive those services, that's normally where you start having impacts and degradation of wetlands because you're thinking in terms of maybe other services first that these ones are really important because they drive the whole system. 
And without those, you might not get the flows of benefits that we got from the other services. OK, we'll quickly try and do the reed bed. Fresh water, zero, is a tidal system. Food from the reed bed. Did anyone get any food coming out of the reed bed? Plus. Why, why one plus? It's a nursery for fish production. It is. It is a nursery, but are people actually taking those fish out and eating them? Nursery, basically this is a habitat supporting service. Thank you very much. Exactly the answer I was looking for. Yeah. So that role as a nursery gets picked up under the supporting service. Because people aren't going in there and taking the small fish and eating them. So that's exactly right. So this is where, where the supporting services are incredibly important. So you're absolutely right. Without The reed bed is a, a very, very important nursery for fisheries, absolutely. But it isn't providing fish directly itself. And you pick that up under the provisioning service. And again, that's a subtle difference, but that's a really important point. And I don't think anyone's harvesting reed. I mean, if anyone's tried to eat reed, it's not very easy to eat. And most people don't harvest it for food for animals either. So I wouldn't see it as, I would see that as a zero. Yeah. Fuel. Zero. Now, now, in some cultures, I know people harvest reed and they do use it to burn, but I don't think in, in Korea that isn't part of the local culture. I don't think so. I've seen that in parts of Africa where you have very much subsistence villages uh, in arid environments where there's not a lot of trees and a lot of wood to burn and they do burn reed, but I think here I would say it's probably zero. What about fiber? Using materials for building or uh, one plus one plus one. Yeah. So I, I think it's probably it's only used locally. I don't think it's something that many many people benefit from. But you're right. We saw thatching in the buildings out on the wetland reserve. We saw fences along the road. Um, but I don't think a huge number. But that's definitely being used. So that's a single plus. Genetic resource, I would say it's probably zero because I'm struggling to think what people might take out of a reed bed. But I would, yeah, I think it's either a zero or a question mark. Okay, natural medicines from the reed bed. Question mark, yeah, I, I would say a question mark or a zero. I mean, from my, I mean, I do a lot of work in reed beds and as far as I know, there's virtually no, I, I can't think of any situation where people have taken medicines out or, uh, but, but so I would probably go for a zero because I've got a bit more knowledge about reed beds. But again, that, if you're not sure, it's a question mark for that one. Ornamental resources. Yeah, I, I think so. And I don't know if anyone noticed, um, but at one point we were standing in, on one of the walls in the visitor center, there were small brushes that people have made from the reed heads. And so there are ornamental and other resources used, so I think we're one plus. Clay or mineral harvesting? Yeah. I would probably go for zero or question mark. It, they're very dense areas. Um, and if I wanted to harvest clay, and I have an open mud flat where I can just walk in and dig up clay, or I have a reed bed that I've got to fight my way through, remove all the vegetation. I'm not going to do that to get the clay. I'm going to go to the mud flat and get the clay. So I think just from human nature, it would make more sense. So I think that's probably a zero. And energy harvesting. I didn't see any water up the up. OK, good. Oh, zero for, yep. So air quality. Yeah. So what is the source of pollution that is causing poor air quality? Because I agree, the, the reed beds in some environments have great potential to improve air quality. So in urban environments, and there is a site in London, one of the sort of densest capitals on the planet, where 
there are roads which are generating a lot of pollution and that you walk into a reed bed and you get to the other side of the reed bed and the air quality you can tell already, you can almost taste the air is better because there is a source of pollution. But in this situation, what is the source of air pollution? Sorry, can we get the microphone? Oh, the tourist boats. So the fumes from the tourist boats are being trapped. Okay, yep. Yep. Okay, I could see that. So that could be a source. And we also saw some vehicles running on the way near the car. Right. So there is a small source of pollution. Okay. Okay, so there's a sort of a local, there are a couple of local sources of pollution, which is good. But again, this, the reason I challenge that is because you've got to think about what is, what is it that is regulating. If there isn't that source, if there weren't the cars, if the boats weren't there, then there would be no source of pollution. In terms of then the number of people are benefiting from that, would you say that was a lot of people or just the local people? Because it could be then the visitors are benefiting. And if we're saying there are hundreds of thousands of visitors, we would say that we'd end up with that being a double plus. Can you see how we've got to that conclusion? So we're saying there's a small source of pollution, um, but many people are benefiting from that because the reeds are, do have the ability to trap and to moderate that pollution. But without that source of pollution, it would be a zero. Or without the visitors, if we didn't have the visitor center, it would maybe only be a single plus. Okay. Local climate regulation. Yep. And reed beds are very, very good at moderating climate. They're actually better than tidal flats or even open water because they carry on absorbing, retaining heat during the night as well. Right. I would say that's a double plus. Again, coastal reed beds are very productive systems. They accumulate a lot of carbon. The reason the reed bed is where it is is because due to the accumulation of carbon and organic material in the soil, it is slightly elevated. And also it traps more sediment because the stems slow the energy down and water get deposits out the sediment. And because of that, they are very, very good stores of carbon. The flip side is because the way reeds grow, they take oxygen down into the soil and the soil isn't as anaerobic, it's much more aerobic, much more... Uh, so you get higher decomposition, but they still accumulate carbon. And they're also quite good in terms of greenhouse gas emissions as well. Okay, water regulation. So they are regulating the flows, but only for a, sort of a few people are benefiting, yep. And flood hazard? Same. And storm hazard? Same. Yep. So they're playing a very similar role to the tidal mudflat in that sense, in terms of regulating storms and floods and flows of water. Pest regulation? You're saying one plus? What? We have a shrug of our shoulders and a no idea at the back. <laughs> so again, with this one, I mean, reed beds can be very good for bird species, small passerines, um, which will eat a lot of insects. And they're very good nesting habitat for things like warblers and buntings, which will be eating bird, uh, insects on the wing. So they can actually be quite good in terms of providing a habitat for those species which will be controlling pests. Um, again, we don't know whether the pest species are there though. Um, I would imagine most wetlands would have some insects which might be a pest species. Um, so I would say, and in terms of the number of people that would be benefiting without knowing the actual sort of number of pest species, it's quite difficult. But I would, I would possibly argue on this one that it could be a one plus or a question mark. It's probably, I'll go for one of those two on this. Um, 
And I think we'll find this with all the ones about pests, unless you know the nature of the, whether there, there are pest species around, which is a local knowledge question, it's really difficult then to actually evaluate it. And equally, if you don't know how the, the sort of ecology of those pest species, whether they, their life cycle involves that part of the wetland, it's very difficult to evaluate. But I would think for that, I would argue you could say it's a, a one plus because you know you would have bird species that might well be controlling. And you say agricultural pests are very adjacent to the heat. Yeah. So uh, through the control of the pest, we can save some agricultural production. That's right, yeah. So, uh, and in disease regulation, I think, again, that's probably much the same. The pests and the disease are quite related. Um, the, pet, your, the point we just made there was actually a very good point, which is about the pests aren't just for humans. The pests could be for crop production or for livestock as well. It's not just about pests for humans. What do we get for disease regulation for humans? Question mark. One plus. One plus. Again, without understanding what diseases people get, it's quite difficult. Um, and in different parts of the world, disease, different diseases are more prevalent. Um, I think in terms of disease, I would, I would probably go for a question mark or it might be a one plus if they are controlling mosquitoes. This isn't a part of the world where you get dengue fever or you get malaria. So that it wouldn't be in terms of controlling mosquitoes for either of those two diseases because it doesn't occur in a career anymore. Uh, this regulation plus, then why uh, uh, we should not consider for human disease it should be plus one or one plus or two plus? Because yeah, that, that's actually making a really good link. So if you're improving the air quality, you're reducing incidence of respiratory disease, of lung disease. So that is still a disease regulation, which is a very good point. Likewise with water quality, if you're purifying the water, you're reducing the risk of uh, people getting diarrhea and dysentery from drinking or eat, eating vegetables that have been washed in polluted water. So you're making that link, thinking again, that's a little more systemic link. So if we're saying that it's regulating, um, if it's purifying water and it's also regulating pests, there's a good argument actually saying it will, be, and it's regulating air quality, it could be improve, risk, uh, preventing disease. Yeah, I, I, I will take that as a yes, so I will give you that one. But it's probably only happening to a few small number of people because, again, you've got to be exposed to the risk for a long time in terms of air quality, maybe not so much from other diseases. So it might only be affecting a small number of people. But it's actually a very good point. It's making that link between the air quality, the water quality, and the vectors of diseases. Okay, livestock. Zero, because I didn't see any livestock there, and the agriculture adjacent to it doesn't really involve livestock. It's mainly um, rice paddy. Erosion regulation. One plus. One plus. Yep. Very good at trapping sediment and reducing energy. Water purification. The same again. So the drainage from the agricultural land was going through the reed bed. Pollination. One plus. So only a few people are. So there were there were pollinators in there. So there's some of the bird species act as pollinators. Um, there were other insects, or winged insects, in there. Uh, I didn't see any of the obvious things, but I know from my experience, a reed bed you do get bee species that actually nest within reeds. Um, so there could be pollinators in there. It's probably not a high number of pollinators and therefore probably not a high number of people that benefit from that. The main beneficiaries would probably be the local farmers. So I'd say one plus. Salinity regulation. Okay. So what you're saying is the reed bed is forming a really good barrier to stop salt water getting into the freshwater areas. For it to be double plus, that means many, many people must benefit. Would you say it was many people or just a few farming? Many people 
So the visitors might be benefiting because they get the experience from the way that the land is managed as an agricultural land, especially in terms of the education and awareness. Okay. Fire regulation. Yeah. Again, where is the source and what is it protecting? Now, now in some situations, reed beds, because they, especially if they're towards the dry end of reed beds, because reeds will survive with water half a metre deep, but they'll also survive with water underneath the ground, maybe 10, 20 centimetres down. In some areas, reed beds are seen as a fire hazard because they dry. They have a lot of dry vegetation that falls down. And if you've got a source of fire and a community that could be at risk, sometimes reed beds can be seen as a negative because they actually, and I've seen reed beds in fire, when they go, they just burn incredibly quickly because they have a lot of vegetation accumulated which is dry and it's just like basically setting fire to straw. But in this situation, it's zero, I'd say. Noise and visual buffering. Yep. And it's interesting, when we were doing the assessment standing on the bank, we couldn't really see the boats. And when we were on the boats, we couldn't see the bank. So it's forming a visual barrier, and it's also trapping a lot of the noise. We couldn't hear the boats, because that's being absorbed by the reed. OK, cultural heritage. Yeah, and, it, and I think some of the um, things like making fences out of the reeds, um, using the reeds in um, hand tools and things is part of the cultural heritage. So I'd say one plus for that. Recreation and tourism? Single plus? Or are we saying double plus? It's all part of the same experience. I would say double plus because many, many people... You think of the pictures that we saw of the, the circular reed beds being used in all the promotional material. People come here because they want to see the reed beds and it is part of the, sort of the, the recreation attraction of the site and likewise for the aesthetic value. Religious, question mark or zero probably. Uh, yeah, I think again this is where we need to ask Yongbo um, she is there? Mr. Sir's here. In terms of the reed beds, any religious or um, spiritual values from the reed beds? Not that I can think of. Uh, not really. No. Not, not really uh, religious. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Inspirational value. And again, I say double plus because. The photos of those reed beds, especially those circular reed beds. I've been to meetings in North America and someone's put the same photo up and I'm thinking, wow. And it has a huge aesthetic and um, sort of inspirational value. Social relationships related to the reed beds. Yeah, there might be sort of small communities involved in harvesting the reeds and making, tool, uh, making products out of it. And education and research. Double plus. Supporting services, soil formation. We've said they're very good at erosion regulation. So I think, again, many of the services depend on them. Primary production, very productive systems. Nutrient cycling. I'm just going to go through these and do them. Water recycling, again, important. And provision of habitat. Right. And I'll save that. So just very quickly, what we're saying is we're looking at those two systems. There are some subtle differences, but they're very, very similar. But a lot of those values are because they are part of an education centre, they're part of a tourist attraction. Um, and so you're seeing that the, the, the cultural values are probably coming out slightly greater than the provisioning values. Um, and so there are differences in different types of wetland, but differences amongst the different types of services. What we're going to do now, just because of time, um, 
I'm going to go straight on and just look at the, the, little, the first man-made wetland that we looked at, the pond, dipping pond, because we haven't got much time and I want to run through these very quickly. And what I'll do is, I hope you don't mind, I'll collect up your sheets afterwards and I'll fill in the rest of them whilst you're having your coffee break and we'll come back up rather than trying to do this in the group. So, so, but for the dipping pond, fresh water. So I would say that, again, who, who is getting that fresh water? Is anyone drinking it? Is anyone using it for agriculture, for washing? I would say no one is actually taking water out of that pond. But it is going into the system which goes into the, um, the rice paddies downstream. So you could argue it is part of that, but I think the volume of water in there is so little that no one is really getting fresh water from it and using that fresh water. So even though there is a source of fresh water, no one is actually really using that. They're not taking it for directly abstracting it for agriculture or for drinking or for washing or whatever. So I would say that was a zero. Does that make sense? It has potential, but that's a different thing. So there's a point there. You for gardening. So, right, so that's actually a really good point. They might be taking water out and watering the plants. That could be the case. Yes, so the next pond down was very dirty. Yeah. So I, I would say, it's, I think it, it has potential, but it's probably also highly unlikely it's being used, but it could have a use such as for watering. And again, we'd need to ask the people in the centre some questions about how do they manage the water from that pond. But I think without the evidence, I would probably say that that's a zero. Yeah, but it, there's no natural system in the pond. Yep. It's a runoff from the from around it, and there, there is a pipe coming into it, but it's, yeah. So I think it is a source of fresh water, undoubtedly, but I don't think that source is being used, therefore it remains as a potential, so it'll be a zero. Food, zero. Fuel, fiber. Genetic resources. <laughs> Medicines. <laughs> I think you're right. And that's because it. All the, I, I don't think there are any provisioning services from that pond. Air quality. So I think there's a possibility, but again, what is the source of pollution? From vehicles? How close were the vehicles to that site? They're quite a distance away. I mean, there could be sort of a... Yeah, I would say, I mean, maybe... Because if you say it's a plus, this is what, what, where it gets interesting. If you're saying that uh, it's regulating the air quality because there's a source of pollution, which might be... It might be from the buildings themselves. They might be a source of pollution. Vehicles are probably a little bit too far away, but there are some vehicles around, uh, and there are vehicles they use for the management of the grounds. Because many, many, many people visit that pond, and it is hundreds of thousands of people go past that pond every year, then what you would say for air quality is that's a double plus. Yeah, because there are th hundreds of thousands of people that are going past that pond. That's the main restaurant in that part of the site. But that is not the only source of... That is not the only source. People pass here get scattered. So, like, uh, although it uh, uh, regulates the air, but what we think is that it's very small. Yeah. Uh, we found there different type of green grasses. Yes. And the role of the green grasses 
But you're saying one plus because the extent is small. Yeah. So. But the the plus relates not to not the extent, but the number of people that benefit. Who's going first? Many visitors and lots of construction also nearby the ponds, and it should be two plus for consideration these sorts of issues. Yeah. So we've got one side saying it should be two plus because there's many people that will be benefiting from that. You're saying it should be one plus because it's only a small area. So you're saying there's a, a limited source of pollution and it is a small area, okay? This is what uh, we were talking about. The number of visitors, not only uh, in that only, it gets scattered to other places too. Right. So if we sort of step back from this and think, actually what we're trying to do is trying to understand the multiple values of a wetland. Um, what we're not doing is trying to quantify those. This is just looking at relative values. Um, what we're trying to do is highlight which services a wetland is providing. As a, if you think back yesterday, I had a triangle. And so this is at the bottom level. So what we're saying is we have a service here which it's, has a, a small source of a problem that it is regulating and it's only happening in a small area. But maybe many, many people will benefit from that, even though it's only a small s source that it's regulating in a small area. At this stage of an assessment, we're not trying to quantify that. We're just trying to have a, a relative in terms of, do many people benefit? If we thought about this as a different service, if we thought about this as there is, let's say, a... a a cultural situation. Let's say it's a, a, t uh, a, a tomb of a, some, someone that's died that's really important from a cultural point of view. And that tomb is marked by one small stone on the ground. It's very small in terms of its area, and it's only one person that's died. Yet hundreds of thousands of people might come and walk past that stone. So in terms of the beneficiaries, even though that's a very small service, in terms of the people that benefit, it's hundreds of thousands. When you move from a qualitative assessment to the quantitative, that's when you start saying, oh, actually, it's regulating the air, but actually, it's only a very small area that's doing that, and there's a very small source of the problem. But many, many people are benefiting. The key thing is to actually identify the fact that even though it's only a small human-made wetland, Many, many people are benefiting from that human-made wetland. Now, the, the level of individual benefit might be very small, but they're still getting that as a benefit. Does that make sense? Because this is, a, this is the first point of a, of a process. If <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like a tomb, as an example, like a tomb in Ho Chi Minh. Vietnam. Yes. But lots of people go there yeah. 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 So although we have written single, uh, all have we have written single plus, but I am agree with you all. Like 
<laughs> so, I mean, that because that's a really interesting one. And the reason I, I say that is when that pond was designed and built, I bet you there was not one person that thought that would be regulating air quality. Now, it might not be doing a lot, and it might not be um, providing a huge benefit, but it is still providing a benefit. And I come back to the point I made on uh, Wednesday. If we don't recognise that as a benefit, the value of that for air quality regulation is zero. And we are undervaluing our wetlands. So that's the reason. But this is still a qualitative assessment only. We will go through this. We'll, we'll get this one finished, then we'll break. So just very quickly, climate regulation in terms of local climate. So that sort of vegetation of open water and the reeds we saw will be regulating the climate without a doubt. It will be cooled in that area, especially because it's, the surfaces around are very hard. And, but many people benefit, so that's a double plus. In terbal, terms of sequestering carbon, it's probably, because it's, it's a very young system, it's three to five years old or something, it probably doesn't have a lot of carbon in it because it's a human-made wetland. So I think probably at the moment it's zero. It might be in future, as it gets older, it would store a lot more carbon. But it's probably also emitting quite a lot of um, greenhouse gases as well. So it, I would probably go for zero at the moment. Water regulation. Is it regulating the flows of water? And I, th I think it is, but it's only in terms of the water that goes through it. I don't think it's regulating the water that benefits the people that visit the site, but it might be benefiting people downstream, which is a small number. In terms of flood hazard, but again, if we thought if that, that wetland is storing water which is coming off the adjacent land, um, and, so, and if many, many, many people are going through that land, would, even though it's only a small area that's storing water, the same scenario, would many people benefit from that? So the people that visit the site, there's many, many people that visit the site are still benefiting from the fact that that is actually reducing the flood. It means they can access the site. It means they're not walking through water up to their knees. Um, so I would say whilst it might be in terms of the, the magnitude of the storage is limited the number of people that benefit because of the location of it if you took the same size wetland and created it somewhere else in the country you might have no one that benefits from it but because of where it is uh, and because it is storing water and reducing flooding within the actual center then it becomes a double plus but the is very small. yeah no, that's right. So the actual magnitude of the storage is small, but the number of people that benefit, even though, and again, it comes back to this point, if you had a thousand little ponds like that in the city of St. John, and they're all storing a little bit of water, and you lost those thousand ponds, because each individual pond, you say, well, that's only storing a little bit of water. We can lose that one. If you lose them all, you have a lot of water that is now in the city. So even though it's only storing a little bit of water, it is still controlling flooding. And again, this is where, especially in urban environments, and I'll talk about Colombo uh, later on, in urban environments we lose a lot of wetlands because we say, oh, they're not important because they don't have any particular biodiversity interest. Yet they're providing lots of other services that we lose. And one of those key ones is their ability to store water. And if you lose one little one, you think, well, it's only one small one. You lose a thousand little wetlands, and each one's storing 100 litres or 100 cubic metres of water, whatever. That water's got to go somewhere when it rains. So, again, as a qualitative assessment, you're not saying it's storing a huge amount of water or a little amount of water. You're saying lots of people are benefiting from it. When you go to the next stage and you quantify it, you can say, actually, they're benefiting, but they're only benefiting maybe one millimetre of water on one day a week, or one day a year or something. <coughs> but I would say, because of the location of it, that would be a double plus. 
storm hazard. This is sort of regulating sort of flows of wind and sort of energy in the environment. I, I think because, again, because of the location of it, it's a very sheltered environment. Um, there are buildings on two sides of it. Um, and it's not a particularly exposed environment. I, I think the chances of storms sort of coming through there are quite limited. Even though many people go there, I don't think it's probably doing a lot from a storm protection point of view. Do people agree with that? So are we happy if we go for a zero there? And in terms of pest regulation? Because it is a stagnant water, a lot of mosquito can produce from her, so it may affect human. The so again, this is not a, uh, most, uh, like a uh, raw pest, this is already uh, no malaria, so there is no question of getting mosquito. What are the chances of uh, getting negative point? Minus one. You're saying a minus one? Yeah. Could be. Could be. Right, I was going to ask, did anyone look in the pond? Did anyone look at the number of dra dragonflies that were around the edge of the pond? Um, did anyone look at the fish in the pond? So I think, absolutely right, it could be a source of mosquitoes. Um, but I counted several species of dragonfly um, and there's small fish in the pond and I think it's actually, the pond has been designed to be attractive to macroinvertebrates because that's, they use that in the educational purposes. And normally a system like that is pretty much an ecological balance where you wouldn't get a lot of mosquitoes because there's enough animals in there that would eat the larvae and also there are many birds around, even in that small area. I saw several birds, um, which would be insect-eating birds. So I think that it's probably been designed and it is managed as a system that's pretty much in balance. So you wouldn't expect there to be lots and lots of mosquitoes coming out of it. However, the pond next to it, which looks stagnant and had algae and with green water in it, is probably a wonderful example of a pond that's great for mosquitoes but that wasn't designed in the way that the other pond was designed and if we had done an assessment of the two ponds this is where I think you would see a real difference so I think at the moment it's neither positive or negative I think the other pond that one next to it that stagnant green pond with the algae would probably be a double minus because again it's not because it's a small pond it's because hundreds of thousands of people walk past it but we didn't do that pond, we did the good pond, which I think is probably a zero, because um, it's not a source of pests. And likewise, I think for disease, it would probably be the same, and there's no livestock. Okay, so erosion. I think zero, because it's a small pond with a small, it hasn't got a high energy environment, so there's no real erosion as a sort of, or risk of erosion. Water purification. So we're saying plus one again because only a sort of small people would benefit from that. And I think, I, I would say it's probably a zero. Well, no, it, it depends which way you want to go because you can say zero because it's, it, it has got a source of water going through it and those, the, the sort of environment will be improving the water quality. Uh, it's taking water running into it, which it's cleaning. Um, in terms of who benefits, though, who is benefiting from that clean water, that purification? You could say the water that leaves the pond, there's maybe only a few people downstream that benefit, which will give you a single plus. You could equally say the people that walk around that pond, um, who then maybe pond dip and look at it and learn from that pond. If there is no, if there is no, uh, if there is no clear water, People would not like to go there. Yes. That's right. So in this one, you, you, there's a sort of choice here because what we're saying is the, the um, supporting service of nutrient recycling is actually really important to maintain that pond. So when we get down to nutrient recycling, um, that's really important because that maintains that pond as a really clear pond, which is a good educational tool. Uh, 
In terms of water purifi purification, you could either say, well, actually, we're not thinking about it in terms of the people that are benefiting from the pond, directly looking at it and pond dipping, but we're thinking about people, water users downstream. So here, I think you could either have a single plus or a double plus. And I think I'd probably go for a single plus and pick up the people that walk around the pond under the, water, the nutrient, the, the sporting service. Okay, pollination. One plus. Yep, so in terms of, I mean, there were several pollinators around, but in terms of who actually benefits from the pollination, it's probably not a huge number of people. Salinity regulation. Fire regulation. One plus. So if the building was on fire, would you stand next to the building or would you stand in the middle of the wetland? I think I would stand in the middle of the wetland. Well, I'd probably run out the site and leave. But um, So it, there is a potential source of fire, because there are buildings with kitchens and things. So there's a source of fire. which, is, um, And if fire was to spread, if you were in the, on the other side of that wetland, you're probably a lot safer than you are if you're standing next to the building. But the likelihood of that is quite low, but it's a possibility. But equally, if you think of how many people would benefit from that, we were saying that the site is visited by hundreds of thousands of people. But probably at one time, you wouldn't have hundreds of thousands of people trying to stand in that pond. You would only have maybe a small number of people would be saying, well, I'm actually going to use this as a benefit. So even though hundreds of thousands of people visit the site, it might be at one time, if there was a fire, only a small number would benefit from that as a way of protecting themselves. So I think that's why this would be one plus. Noise and visual buffering. Yep, I think because you can walk all the way around it. And I was standing on one side, and I still heard one of the groups talking and laughing on the other side, um, when they should have been working rather than laughing. Okay, we'll just go through the cultural ones. So cultural heritage, zero. zero. It's a new pond. It has no cultural history. Recreation and tourism. <laughs> Aesthetic value. It has, to me, the giveaway with that was it said photo point. <laughs> so people, and I'm sure if this is one of those ones that, it, I mean, I don't understand the technology, I'm too old, but if you went onto Instagram or Facebook, I'm sure... If you could find some way of tracing that, a photo taken from that point, there would be thousands and thousands of people have taken their photo at that point. Um, spiritual or religious? Zero. I would say so. Inspiration? Yeah. I would say double plus, because many people go there and it's a, they'll sit and have their coffee, look at the pond, get inspired by it, look at the giant crabs. Social relations. Now, I, I would say that there's probably a, a network of people that um, are involved in the pond in terms of volunteers, in terms of people that are uh, educators that are their own sort of little network. But it's not probably many people. Even though many people visit, they don't necessarily form a social group. But there is a small social group that are the way people that are responsible for monitoring and evaluating the pond and education. So I think that's probably a single plus. And education and research, double plus. And then just quickly the soil formation. Zero. So is soil forming in there? I said, well, there's plants that are growing. They're depositing their leaves back into the water, it's, there, is a, there is some sediment coming in, so there is a very low level of soil formation. Um, and that is actually maintaining all the actual pond. It's maintaining the sort of um, biological communities in that pond. So even though it's probably a very small level of soil formation, it is actually quite important in, try, in terms of driving the pond. And again, because all these other people depend on this, 
it's actually a double plus. Does that make sense? It doesn't, doesn't make sense? <laughs> You're not agreeing, okay. Do you want to use the microphone and explain why? Because I'm happy to listen to an alternative. There should be one on the table. Right. How soil is forming uh, and that indicates double plus? I don't think so. So, if the soil wasn't forming in that pond, if, if the plants weren't growing, the sediment wasn't sort of being washed into there, um, the, the ecological community would be very different. It would, um, w without those processes, some of the ecological processes that would be that being driven by the soil formation wouldn't be happening. And um, if you didn't have those processes happening, then the other benefits that the pond is providing would be compromised. And if we're saying that some of the other processes many, many people benefit from, without those supporting services, the other people don't benefit from them. Even though it's only a small pond. Even though the be a very small amount of soil that's forming but you're still getting soil forming in there because ultimately that pond if that pond was just left without any management it will fill up with sediment and vegetation and water would the amount of sort of open water would decrease over time so it's being managed and because it's being managed in a way as a resource for hundreds of thousands of people and that part of that management is the, the formation of soil within it so even though, it's a, again, it comes down to this magnitude of how much soil over what time, but without that soil forming in there, you wouldn't get a lot of the biological and biogeochemical processes. You wouldn't get some of the nutrient cycling processes. So these other services would be compromised. And because they were compromised and because many, many people benefit from those other services, then it wouldn't... It has to be double plus. However, if you had a situation where your other services only benefited a small number of people, then you might have a single plus here. Because even though it's a supporting service, it's only supporting services which a few people benefit from. But in this situation, it's supporting services that many, many people benefit from. So that's why this would have to be a double plus as with probably all of the supporting services. So you might have a wetland where you have no other double pluses. You might only have a small number of people that benefit maybe from flood hazard protection or whatever it might be. In that case, you might justify a single plus here. Do you want... Uh, actually, and that one was not so big, but... Uh, there were some phytoplanktons and only the grasses were also present. Yeah. And, and the main function of the plant is to uptake, to take, take up minerals, nutrients, yeah. Minerals. And uh, during the formation of soil, the process of formation of soil, they go through the mineral formation. That's right. And it, uh, it normally, soil formation process takes a long time. Yeah. So it is the process. It is a process of formation of with you. Yeah. Yes. So, and I think that the challenge comes here is to try, to try and think about the supporting services in terms of what is it they are supporting. And if they are supporting a functioning wetland which is providing multiple benefits to multiple stakeholders, multiple people, then they have to be double plus because there are many, many people that benefit. And if you took that supporting service out of the equation, then the other services wouldn't be delivered and the many people wouldn't benefit. So almost by default, and this is where we're ending up, that the supporting services, if you have other services that have many people benefiting from them, then there's a very high likelihood that the supporting services will also be double plus. There are some situations where that might not be the case, but usually that would be the case. And again, it comes back to, it's not the, the amount of soil or the area or the volume, 
It's the fact that it is supporting other services. Is that clear? Because this is one of, the, one of the reasons that many assessments do not look at supporting services. Because they just say, well, supporting services are captured in the other services. But actually, sometimes it's important to keep them, to think about them, because it's these supporting services that really drive the functioning of the system. And if you don't think about how the system's functioning, then you might make management decisions which compromise those. Um, so in this situation, I would say, and just for the sake of expediency, that even though um, oh, it was a small pond, all of these should be double plus, because many other people are benefiting from the other services. And without those supporting services driving the system, then you wouldn't get those other benefits. Does that make sense? And this is one of the hardest points. This is something which we, a lot of people struggle with. But it's just, it, and there's a reason we've kept supporting services in the assessment. And in many assessments, people don't look at supporting services. If you were doing an economic analysis, a financial calculation, and you looked at soil formation, and you said, OK, the value of soil formation is X whatever dollars. And then you looked at, um, let's say, uh, erosion regulation. And you say, well, that's X million dollars or whatever. You're double counting. But we're not doing an economic analysis. So in a lot of the financial or economic monetized studies, people would ignore these supporting services because of double counting. You're counting the same thing twice, so you're adding two lots of the same value, which is inflating the value. We're not doing a, a monetization. We're just doing a relative value. And the reason that I think it's important to look at the supporting services is to, is to understand how these supporting services and the processes that lay behind them really deliver the other services. And when we're trying to manage a site, quite often, it's these sort of things we think about in terms of management activities. How do we maintain those supporting services? Because if you don't maintain them, you lose the link with the other benefits. OK, it's been a long okay. session. I have one, one, just one question. That is, uh, in terms of regulatory services, yes. this is a man-made uh, pond. Yes. Is there any way to say that is, uh, this is the source of mosquito? Potentially. Potentially, yes. And well, the reason is to get the benefit, people should get benefit from this ecosystem. Yes. But if there is mosquito, many people come here and many people work in the different buildings also. Mm -hmm. This is the negative point, I think. If there is lots of mosquito and the regulatory system, especially the best regulatory system yes. doesn't work, people will not get benefit. Yeah. So. People will still get some of those benefits. But if people make it, make it yeah. the bite of Ab Absolutely. So what you would do, if we, were to, if we had assessed the other pond next to it, which had very bad water quality, it's quite stagnant, probably is a breeding ground for mosquitoes. If we'd assessed that pond, um, and let's say that pond was being used in exactly the same way for pond dipping. It was in the same location where people could walk around it and look at it. You would still get some of those other benefits. But under pest regulation, because it was a source of mosquitoes, you would score that as double negative. So it doesn't mean you would lose the other services. It's just you would pick up that negative service, that disbenefit, under pest regulation um, because people you're absolutely right people might still go there and take their photo they might still walk around and go oh look there's a pond they might still be doing pond dipping and people might be learning about the pond so you're getting the education it might still be protecting you from fire so it's still delivering those other services but you're right it's also a disbenefit for many many people so on that situation you would score the pest regulation and possibly also the disease as negative. So it doesn't mean just because you get one negative you don't get the other positives. 
Um, and that's the way you address that, as you'd pick that up. And we'll look at an example of that um, later on. OK, that's been hard work. But I think hopefully that's been useful for you. And just quickly before we sort of go off for coffee, I mean, what that does show, which I think is sort of what I expected, is we are picking up differences. I mean, the provisioning services is the obvious one. And if we, we don't have time to look at the rice paddy, but if we looked at the rice paddy, that has a high level of provisioning service. Um, the car park lake is very similar to the pond dipping lake, but even worse because you have much lower cultural services. So it does show that different types of wetland deliver different services, but it also it helps you reinforce this link between how the actual wetland or part of the wetland is working and how humans benefit. I will ask if the team leaders can share the, the other sheets for the Rice Paddy, Tidal Creek and Car Park Lake with me and then I will update the rest of this. But we will have a 15 minute break now because you've all been working hard. Thank you very much. Okay.